from the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line with today's host, Father Wade Menezes. In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Welcome to EWTN's Open Line Tuesday. We talk faith, family, and fellowship on Tuesday. Father Wade Menezes is in the house. He's literally in the house. He's here in studio with us uh, on the Irondale campus here at EWTN. So if you've got a question for Father Wade, please pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is 1-205-271-2985, and we'll put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. You can always send us an email, openline at EWTN.com, or you can text your question to Father Wade. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response, text your first name and your question, message, and data rates may apply. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your call screener is Ryan Penny and Jeff Burson handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook Live, uh, type a question into the chat window, and it may get to us by the end of the program. And our host is he is every Tuesday. Our very own favorite, Father of Mercy, Father Wade Menezes. How are you? I'm doing great, Jack. I'm on vacation this week, and uh, it actually starts tomorrow. So today's a work day. So since I'm just kicking back at the shrine there, the Most Blessed Sacrament in Hansville, I thought I'd drive into Irondale today and do the show in studio. Is that your your kicking it on vacation frock that you're wearing today? I know yes, that's right. I, we call you guys this have a button or a pin or a crucifix or something for every hour of the day. It seems like that's right. That's our Father's of Mercy pin. It's not the large one that appears on our cassock habit. It's the small one for the clerical shirt. Uh, the joke is that this one's accidentally put into the washer and dryer, and so it shrinks from the size of <laughs> the one that's on the cassock. But uh, yeah, this is priest casual today. So, uh, but uh, yeah, it's great to be in town here. You know, it's uh, the Knights of Columbus are familiar to most people for various reasons. Um, you know, some positive, some not as positive. There's some stereotypes that linger that are that are not necessarily accurate or fair, in mm. my opinion. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, the past Holy Fathers have have called the Knights of Columbus things like their strong right arm. Uh, it's the largest fraternal organization in the world, and um, the. Uh, the founder of the, the Knights of Columbus, Father Michael J. McGivney, who did so at St. Mary's Parish in New Haven, Connecticut, um, in 1852, um, did so in a very humble fashion, a very humble parish priest who took extremely heroic action against intense persecution, uh, not only of the Catholic people, but also in response to the extreme poverty of the widows that were left behind, uh, when fathers and heads of households would die, and and I mean, if 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 the primary uh, fruit of sainthood is heroic virtue, mm. you don't have to look very far to find it in the life of Michael McGivney. That's exactly right, and uh, praise God, he was beatified this past October thirty first, twenty twenty. Uh, and is now an official blessed of the church. And, you know, God raises up saints during the times that they will benefit those of us who are members of the church. Everybody hear that? Everybody listening right now hear that? That's right. That's right. Uh, we We are seeing saints raised up for this modern era in which we live, who have something about their life that is applicable to our life now, and that's the case with uh, Father Michael Joseph McGivney. He was born to Irish immigrants in 1852 in Waterbury, Connecticut. He was the eldest of 13, 13 children, six of whom died in childhood. His father, Patrick, worked in one of the city's brass mills, and at age 13, young Michael left school to work in one of those mills himself, like his father. After answering his vocational call to the priesthood, He studied for five years in Canada, but returned home to help his mother care for the family when his father died in 1873. So he came from a family that at one point was fatherless. Before long, he returned to his seminary studies, this time in Baltimore, Maryland. 
He was ordained four years later a priest in 1877. In 1882, within five years of his priestly ordination, Father McGivney founded the Knights of Columbus. Eight years later, he died at only age 38 while serving as pastor of St. Thomas Church in Thomaston, Connecticut, and Immaculate Conception Church in Terryville, Connecticut. We most likely think of Father McGivney as Pope Benedict XVI did in his 2008 homily in New York St. Patrick's Cathedral as, quote, that exemplary American priest, end quote, whose legacy is so much a part of the impressive growth of the Catholic Church in America during the 19th century. But we also do well to recall that many of the struggles Father McGivney faced were very similar to those we priests face today in 2020. For example, the Catholic Church in Father McGivney's time faced a serious priest shortage as a result of illness and premature death. During the 12 years of his priestly ministry, 70 of the 83 priests of the Diocese of Hartford, Connecticut, died, including both of the young pastors under whom he served. As a young pastor himself, Father McGivney had to oversee two parishes and celebrated three Masses on Sunday mornings between those two parishes. He was, like most priests today, tremendously overworked. Nine months into his assignment at St. Mary's Church in New Haven, Connecticut, he wrote, quote, I have been alone all summer with the whole work of a parish on my shoulders. I have not had time for even one day's vacation since I left seminary, end quote. In fact, he would not have a vacation for the next four years. And here I am, Jack, on a week off, staying at the Shrine of the Most Blessed <laughs> Sacrament, right? Like many parishes today, too, financial debt was a major burden for Father McGivney. When he arrived at a newly, as a newly ordained priest at St. Mary's, the parish faced a debt equivalent to about $3.5 million today. The New York Times criticized St. Mary's as not only an eyesore, quote unquote, but also as a, quote, complete failure as a business enterprise, end quote. Much of Father McGivney's efforts would be spent confronting this debt, and he would even re-gift to the parish his own personal donations given to him at Christmas time. And like today, immigrants were a strong presence in the United States during Father McGivney's years of priesthood. At St. Mary's Parish, those immigrants were mostly Irish, but Father McGivney had entered the seminary in Quebec, Canada, because it would help him better serve the many French-speaking Canadian Catholics living in Connecticut. In fact, he responded in a very personal way to the many problems confronting his immigrant parish community, such as homelessness, substance abuse, violence, and family breakups. In his first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, Pope Benedict XVI wrote about the need to cultivate a heart that sees, a heart that sees, where love is needed. Such a charitable heart was at the center of Father McGivney's ministry as a parish priest and was the basis and reason for his founding the Knights of Columbus for Catholic men and for supplying widowed women and families with insured financial support following the death of the breadwinner, predominantly the husband and father during the era that the organization was founded. In a 1992 address, Pope John Paul II said, quote, parishes must be centers of charity, open to the spiritual and material needs of the wider community. The time has come to commit the church's energies to a new evangelization beginning in the parish, a mission whose fruitfulness depends in no small measure upon the laity, end quote. Well, Father McGivney got this memo, we could say, way before John Paul II quoted it. More than a century earlier, Father McGivney seems to have already well understood this great truth. In the late 19th century, Catholics were regularly excluded from labor unions and other organizations that provided social services. In addition, Catholics were either barred from many of the popular fraternal organizations that existed at the time, or, as in the case of Freemasonry, forbidden from joining by the Catholic Church itself. Father McGivney wished to provide men with a solidly Catholic alternative. He also believed that Catholicism and fraternalism were not incompatible and wished to found a society for men that would encourage the men to be proud of their American Catholic heritage. Instead of the name Knights of Columbus, Father McGivney had originally conceived of the name Sons of Columbus. But James Mullen, who would eventually become the first Supreme Knight, successfully suggested that Knights of Columbus would better capture the ritualistic nature of the new organization. The order was founded 10 years before the 400th anniversary of Columbus's arrival in the New World and during a time of renewed interest in him. 
Columbus was a hero to many American Catholics, and the naming of him as patron of the order was partly an attempt to bridge the division that existed between the Irish Catholic founders of the order and Catholic immigrants of other nationalities living in Connecticut. Today, Jack, the Knights of Columbus is the world's largest Roman Catholic fraternal service organization and is dedicated to the four primary principles of charity, unity, fraternity, and patriotism. There are more than 1.8 million members in 15,000 councils with nearly 200 councils existing on college campuses alone. More to say about Father Michael J. McGivney on this uh, Open Line Tuesday with Father Wade Menezes. Uh, plenty of time for your phone calls and wide open lines for you at 833-288-EWTN. It's Open Line Tuesday with Father Wade. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. St. Paul says in the scriptures, knowledge puffs up. So I think maybe that's the connection between, unfortunately, a lot of modernity where we've discovered this intricate order to stuff and yet the rise of atheism among a lot of people. Remember when we were kids, we'd say, hey, I know a few things. My, my mom or dad would say, yeah, that's right. You know a few things, a very <laughs> few things. Morning Glory, talking about everything important to today's Catholic. Tomorrow morning, 7 Eastern on EWTN Radio. You guys, this is a hard time because in the midst of the fears, there's new priorities heaped upon us. So talk about a recipe for stress. I mean, congrats, you're suddenly a homeschooling family and you have seven different teachers sending you different topics that you have to get done every day and your work is saying you can work from home, but you also have to get all these other things done. And listen, here's what I wanna tell you right now. Do your best, forget the rest, okay? I mean, we have a schedule we're keeping. Our kids have done homeschooling at X hour. Even if we kind of failed or they kind of failed at it, and we're moving on to the next thing in the day. And at the end of the day, as you unwind a little bit or try to unwind, Take it easy on yourself. You'll get back to the grind of life. Trust me, you'll get back to the phase where it's easy to accomplish every to-do on your list. But right now, the top priority, and you can't forget this, in the midst of all those to-dos, is keeping yourself where you need to be in relation to God and loving and joyful as possible for the people around you. God bless you. For more, text Chris at 44144. This is Chris Stefanik on EWTN Radio. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, EWTN opens the holy, offers rather, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass live every day at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we all have busy schedules. You want to make sure you don't miss it. You can actually subscribe, and we can send a link to your email box every day. Visit EWTN.com and click on subscribe. If you'd like to be part of the program, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 288 Three nine eight six. We're talking today on this Tuesday edition of EWTN's Open Line about recently beatified, blessed Father Michael J. McGivney. Yeah, that's right, Jack. You know, the Knights of Columbus councils uh, have been chartered in many, many places in many different countries. In the United States, in Canada, for example, Mexico, in the Caribbean, Guatemala, Panama, the Dominican Republic, the Philippines, Guam, Spain, Japan, Cuba, and most recently in Poland. The Knights' official junior organization for young men, called the Colombian Squires, has over 5,000 councils established just amongst themselves. And in 1954, lobbying efforts by the Knights of Columbus helped convince the United States Congress to add the phrase, quote, under God, end quote, to the Pledge of Allegiance. President Dwight Eisenhower wrote to then Supreme Knight Luke Hart, thanking the Knights of Columbus for their part in the movement to have the words under God added to our country's Pledge of Allegiance. Similar lobbying efforts convinced many state legislatures to adopt October 12th as Columbus Day and led to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's confirmation of Columbus Day as a federal holiday in 1937. On March 15, 2008, Pope Benedict XVI approved a decree recognizing the heroic virtue of Father Michael McGivney. 
The Pope's declaration significantly advanced Father McGivney's process towards sainthood, and the declaration allowed Catholics to now refer to Father Michael McGivney with the title Venerable and Servant of God. If his cause is successful, ultimately to sainthood, he will be the first priest born in the United States to be canonized a saint. I want to, I want to repeat that. If his cause to sainthood, actual canonization to sainthood is successful, because he was beatified just a few weeks ago, he will be the first priest born in the United States to be canonized a saint. Some of the titles given to Father Michael McGivney include Servant of Charity, Confessor of Souls, Apostle to the Young, Protector of Christian Family Life, Man of Pastoral Action, I love that one, Man of Pastoral Action, and Joyful Celebrant of the Sacred Liturgy. Father Michael McGivney was beatified on October 31st, 2020, as I already said, at St. Joseph Cathedral in Hartford, Connecticut. The following day on November 1st, 2020, the Great Solemnity of All Saints, a Mass of Thanksgiving for his beatification, was held at St. Mary's Church in New Haven, Connecticut, the very parish church where he had served as pastor. And you know, Jack, uh, about two and a half to three years ago, I read, in one year, I read the biographies of both Father Michael McGivney and Father Augustine Tolton, the first African-American priest ordained in the United States, and I kept a track of different masculine characteristics and virtues um, that that the two men shared as priests, for my own benefit, but also for the benefit of, say, priest retreats or even men's retreats that I could share these. And this is the list that I came up with in regards to, to masculine uh, virtue, uh, ma- masculine virtues, characteristics of men, especially in their vocation, and in this case specifically as priests, but forgiveness and mercy, fatherly instinct, loyalty and compassion, humility and fidelity or faithfulness, lover of wisdom and searcher for truth. I love that. Lover of wisdom and searcher for truth. Fraternity and camaraderie, allegiance and constancy, a provider, a providing spirit. Look at all he did with with the the widows, with children, providing them the insurance funds through the organization, the Knights of Columbus. An instilled sense of duty and responsibility moral uprightness and strength, bravery, courage, chivalry, leader, affability and approachability, protector and defender, patriot or patriotism, steadfastness, moderation, self-control, one who recognizes the, 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 the value of the dignity of human labor, and lastly, an instilled sense of valor. So I'd like to invite our listeners today, male or female, to tell us how the Knights of Columbus and or how Father Michael McGivney have influenced their life. Hopefully we got some Knights listening right now of of any of the four degrees, or maybe a Colombian squire listening right now who wants to call in the show and uh, rejoice with us today over the great beatification of a great priest, Father Michael Joseph McGivney. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-3986. First up is Lily in Elk City, Oklahoma, listening to EWTN on Sirius XM Channel 130. Lily, you are on with Father Wade Menezes. Good afternoon, Father. I have a difficult situation going on. I have a child who has left the, the Catholic faith. I'm a cradle Catholic. My un- I have an uncle that was a bishop. My grandfather and my father were both knights, by the way. Oh, fantastic. My question to you is, my question to you is my daughter has chosen to leave the church. I have been entrusted to uh, take my grandchildren to RE class. I've, I've enrolled them, and I'm trying to get them to... Uh, I have one that's going to receive First Communion this year. The other one is a teenager who didn't go to class for a year and a half, and so I'm trying to play catch-up with her. And my daughter, one of the... Con- she told me that that was fine with her. Um, and but she's also made comments to me that uh, she says, uh, 
in front of the teenager. I don't understand why she needs to learn or why she should be able to make up her mind when she gets old enough. And I have reminded her that I'm her godmother. I'm not just her grandmother. I'm her godmother. And it's my responsibility to do this, even if you don't. And I don't know how to... I don't know how to reach her at this point to be able to help my grandchildren who so desperately need it. Right, right. Well, thank you so much, Lily, for your call today from Elk City, Oklahoma. Uh, You know, it's worth also reminding your daughter the promises she made at at that grandchild of yours, baptism. When she, as the parent of that child, promised the priest at the baptism that she would raise the child in the faith. And uh, uh, that's a promise made before Almighty God, okay, through the sacramental process, through the administration of the sacrament of baptism. And so that's a serious thing that is not meant to be taken lightly. So not only do you want to share with your daughter that you as the godmother, as well as the grandmother, have a duty, a religious duty, a moral duty, Uh, to raise the grandchild in the faith and to help them learn the faith, but she herself as the mother has the duty, okay, that that she herself made the promises at baptism. And a good thing you could do to show her that, say, tell tell your daughter, say, honey, look at this. Say, I've printed off the baptismal rite of the Catholic Church. These are the very words that you may not remember from 14 years ago or 13 years ago when, when Johnny or Susie was baptized. But, but it's worth recalling to mind what we promised God, what we're going to have to one day answer for. Okay. Now, beyond that, realize that you are not the legal guardian of that child. You are also not your daughter's savior. Again, privately, charitably, and rarely, we give fraternal correction to loved ones who are not living the faith the way they should be living it. Beyond that, they've got to work out their own salvation, as St. Paul says, with fear and trembling, and hopefully with a filial fear rather than a servile fear. You can continue to do what you're doing, but you can't let your peace become disrupted if your daughter, A, just doesn't get involved herself, but lets you continue to raise the grandchild, her child in the faith, and B, you can't lose your faith if your daughter ceases you from being an influence in the child's religious faith formation. Either way, you can't lose your faith. You've done your part. You've reminded your daughter of, of the seriousness of raising the child in the faith, of the promises she made to God through, the, through baptism through that baptism that day, however many years ago it took place. That's what you want to remind your daughter about. In the meantime, I want to recommend to you a new book that's just out that is just a fantastic book. It's titled Trustful Surrender, Stories of Grace Amidst Crises. In large part, it's about Catholic loved ones who have left the faith. It's by Debbie Giorgiani and Jerry Usher, the hosts of Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. Uh, It's on each day, Monday through Friday, here on EWTN Global Catholic Radio. Uh, Again, Trustful Surrender, Stories of Grace Amidst Crisis. I would urge you to maybe take that on as some spiritual reading during this time. Remember, you need to approach your daughter where she's at in her faith. Why? Because God approaches us where we are at. Not everybody's going to be at in your family where you are, Lily, Um And so you need to be able to approach them where they are, but be ready to be a great apologist of the faith, a great reminder of the faith to your daughter of what she promised God, however many number of years ago when that child was baptized, and that it's incumbent upon her, even even coalescing with her own salvation of how she raises that child in the faith. And again, that's not through fear of God that's servile, that's through fear of God that's filial. A, a, a child who loves its parent and so much so that it doesn't want to disappoint them. That's the, that's the view of fear that your daughter should have towards God, that she doesn't want to uh, disappoint him because she loves him so much. And so she will raise her child correctly in the faith. Where a servile fear is the fear of an underling under a, a superior who's afraid of a punishment. That's servile fear. That's not the kind of fear we're supposed to have of God. We're supposed to have a filial fear. From the, from the Latin word filius, which means son, literally, or, or um, meaning colloquially a, do- a child or son or daughter. We have a son or daughter fear of God, uh, which is the fear of a child who doesn't want to disappoint the parent, precisely because they know the parent loves them. 
It's the fear of not wanting to disappoint. Hopefully those those pointers will help you out, Lily. Thank you for your great uh, defense of the faith to your daughter and, and to wanting to raise your grandchildren. Also, your godchild in the faith. Thank you so much. That's a great witness. Thank you. And also you'll have the whole army of EWT and Open Line Tuesday listeners praying for you and your family as well. Amen. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Plenty of time for your phone calls at 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd love to hear from you as well. Your number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Dan in Plano, Texas, Lucy in Dallas, Texas, and there's plenty of time for your calls as well. It's EWTN's Open Line Tuesday. We're talking faith, family, and fellowship with Father Wade Menezes. Raymond Arroyo. We need EWTN Radio for the reason that Mother Angelica founded this enterprise. She saw this as a holistic approach, reaching the whole person, bringing them truth and life. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. This is Mike and Alicia Hernan with a Messy Family Minute. For years, we felt like bad Catholics because with our young family, we didn't have enough energy to cooperate in our parish campaigns to do works of mercy in our community. Then the realization came, the works of mercy can be practiced in the home. As a matter of fact, they should be first practiced at home. What do parents do every day? Clothe the naked, give food to the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, shelter the homeless. Maybe even visit the imprisoned when you send them to their rooms. (laughs) Think about it. There is no one you see every day who needs you more than your children. Your kids have nothing except what you give them. They are dependent upon you for their physical survival, but also for their emotional, psychological, and spiritual health. Begin by showing mercy within your home and allow it to be a means of transformation for you. You can take the ordinary work of your life and transform it into a means of extraordinary grace. For more encouragement and resources, visit us at MessyFamilyMinute.org. Here's a thought from Mother Angelica's Perpetual Calendar. The gift of understanding raises me a step higher and lets me enter into the very mystery of God. I begin to see ever so dimly how He lives in me and I live in Him, and this affects my interior life with God. Mother's Perpetual Calendar features an inspirational message for each day of the year. It's available from the EWTN Religious Catalog at EWTNRC.com. Hi, this is Cy Kellett. Later today on Catholic Answers Live, two hours of open forum with Tim Staples. You don't want to miss that. Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now back to Open Line with Father Wade Menezes. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288. 3986. Be sure to check out Women of Grace tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. It's Wacky Wednesday with Sue Brinkman. And of course, the prettiest host in Catholic Radio, John Ant Williams. So that's uh, Women of Grace, Wacky Wednesday with Sue Brinkman tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Right here on EWTN Radio. Boy, you just you phones, just made some husband points. You just made some husband points by saying that. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I know where my bread is buttered. Um, <laughs> back to the phones we go. Lucy is in Dallas, Texas. She's listening to EWTN on Guadalupe Radio. Maybe she is. There's Lucy. Hi, Lucy. How are you? Hey, great. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Father Wade. I, I, I have heard that one of the things that we can do as an act of charity or to be charitable is to pray for those in purgatory. And I, I don't know if there are any specific prayers that are best directed to you know, souls in purgatory. Is there, how should we prepare ourselves to pray for those in purgatory? Well, great, great question. First of all, you want to, in the best of your ability... Uh, have the simple moral knowledge that you're in a state of sanctifying grace, which simply means that you're not aware of any moral, mortal sins. That way you know that your prayers are as efficacious as they can be. 
Okay, you've, you've gotten yourself on track first to become a powerful, powerful intercessor for those uh, holy souls in purgatory, members of the church suffering, and for those members of the church militants still living on earth that you might be praying for as well. Uh, maybe in a daily uh, offering for your spouse, for example, or a daily prayer for your spouse who's still living. That's just an example. So the first thing we want to do to be powerful intercessors as members of the church militants still living on earth is to have the simple uh, moral certitude that we're not in a state of mortal sin. And it's very possible during any given day at any given time to stop what you're doing, whether you're putting gas in your vehicle, whether you're shopping at the store, whether you're on your way to church, whether you've already entered the church and you're doing your preparatory prayers as you're kneeling there, you just entered the church waiting for Mass to begin, and you're calling to mind maybe any venial sins. It's very possible to stop at any given point of the day and say to yourself, to your inmost heart of hearts, and mean it, and say, you know what? To the best of my sincerest of knowledge... I'm not aware of any mortal sin on my soul. That is to say, grave matter done with fullness of knowledge and done with deliberate consent of your will. Those are the three elements that make a mortal sin present. If any one of those three is missing or any two of them are missing, then you have a venial sin. So we want to have the moral certitude we're in a state of sanctifying grace because then your prayers are most efficacious before God's eyes. Also, you have the seven gifts and the 12 fruits of the Holy Spirit working in you at various levels, depending on how well you've worked those seven gifts and 12 fruits. And the ones that are more latent in you, you want to keep doing in actual uh, exercises throughout the day, like like do something courageous to grow in courage or fortitude. Uh, that It's like working a muscle. Each time you work that muscle, that muscle grows. Each time you work that, that gift or that fruit of the Holy Spirit, it grows in you, okay? So now that you've worked on self, the highest prayer you can offer for the holy souls in purgatory is the holy sacrifice and banquet of the Mass. This is why the month of November, an entire month, is set aside for the holy souls in purgatory right? And we cannot lose sight of that. So you might want to contact your parish church and make a stipend offering of nine masses that may or may not be offered all during November, but even if they're not, that's fine too, and offer a novena of masses for the Holy Souls in Purgatory. How about your daily regular rosary? having a specific intention during your regular daily rosary, not necessarily an extra rosary that day, unless you want to do that, that's fine, but maybe your work schedule, your family schedule doesn't permit that second rosary. Offer your regular daily rosary in a particular way, with the primary intention be for, being for the holy souls in purgatory. There's that beautiful image in the Sistine Chapel, I believe it's in the southeast corner of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, of our Blessed Mother wrenching souls out of purgatory into heaven with her rosary. The souls are grasping onto her rosary as she's pulling them up, pulling them up out of purgatory. And, and Michelangelo painted that. And you know what he did with that particular image of the Blessed Mother? She has a huge old bicep. Isn't that awesome? A huge bicep because her strength as the mother of God is wrenching souls out of purgatory into heaven with the rosary. So the rosary is draped on the palm of her hand, hanging downward, and the holy souls are grabbing onto it, and she's pulling them up. So that whole image, even to the bicep and the muscle of the bicep being formed, that's a very theological point right there that Michelangelo is trying to make. The strength of the mother of God praying for us, we cannot lose sight of that, okay? How about your daily Divine Mercy Chaplet? How about uh, being offered for the Holy Souls of Purgatory in a special way, or, or doing a second Divine Mercy Chaplet? It only takes about seven minutes to pray. Um, say an extra Divine Mercy Chaplet. Uh, I've been doing every day this month, so far, an extra chaplet of Divine Mercy specifically for the Holy Souls in Purgatory and specifically prayed in a cemetery or at a cemetery. Uh, for the first um, nine days, it was at the Fathers of Mercy Cemetery, where five of our members are buried since we've moved there in 87, 1987, and five Benedictines are buried while they were there before us because we purchased property that was a former Benedictine monastery. So there's a total of um, uh, 11 graves there, six Fathers of Mercy and five Benedictines. So I've been walking that sh cemetery every day praying my extra Divine Mercy Chaplet. And at the end of the Divine Mercy Chaplet, I offer an Our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be, and Apostles' Creed. Uh, for the needs and intentions of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and for an alleviation of all the holy souls in purgatory, especially my parents, grandparents, friends, and relatives, those known and unknown to me, and especially the most forgotten soul in purgatory. 
Amen to that. And, the, and our Lord and Our Lady can take all those prayers and offer it up as an alleviation of their suffering. And then this morning on the 10th, because I'm already at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament, I went and prayed my extra chaplet already for my holy souls in purgatory uh, at the little cemetery where the aborted babies are buried, uh, or the miscarried babies that naturally miscarried, where they're buried there on the shrine grounds uh, beneath the, the beautiful, beautiful Pieta statue that's right across from the priest's retreat house. And these days that I'm at the shrine, that's where I will pray that daily extra chaplet. Uh, there's also a secondary location at the foot of the piazza near the parking lot that leads up to the actual shrine where there's a beautiful outdoor statue of Our Lady of Sorrows. And there's, uh, I believe, three or four more uh, aborted uh, babies buried there. So uh, I've been very fortunate that where I'm at these first 10 days of November, I've been able to pray that that extra Divine Mercy Chaplet specifically for the Holy Souls. Uh, you could also just offer your own prayers, whatever you want to offer as your own prayers. Maybe your morning offering to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. You want to double not only as your personal morning offering, but you want it to uh, also double as a prayer for the holy souls in purgatory for an alleviation of their suffering, especially those most abandoned in purgatory who have no one to pray for them. Do some of these suggestions help you out? Oh my goodness, you gave me so many, and, and actually the, probably one of the most important things was what you said at the very beginning was preparing myself to be um, you know, in, in a state of grace, yes, and the, think about that before I start praying for others. Absolutely, to be the best intercessor you can be, so that those seven gifts and twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit are powerfully working in you and powerfully working through you. In other words, they're going out of you, and you're on your way to becoming a great saint. Never, ever forget that. What a great question to pray for the holy souls and how to do it, and uh, thank you so much for your call. We greatly appreciate it. We'll stay in the Republic of Texas. Dan is in Plano, Texas, also listening on Guadalupe Radio. A first-time caller. Dan, thanks for holding. Welcome to the program. Oh, thank you so very much. I want to uh, give a Father Wade a shout-out from Council 7850 in Plano, Texas. Great. And uh, I've been... <clears throat> Go ahead. I was just going to say, great. Thank you so much for that shout-out. I appreciate it. God bless your council. Oh, thank you so very much. I've, I've been a knight for, for about 20 years, and I, I would just, uh, I had such a sense of pride when you spoke about Father McGivney and, and the beatification and, and our fraternity of men that I thought I'd pull over and give it a call. So I'm actually a first-time caller, but I just, I just want you to know that for, for myself, and I'm sure for a lot of knights, it is a fraternity of men that has really improved um, my spirituality. Mm. Um, you know, our, our leadership helps us, you know, to, to be good Catholic men. Um, and, and we share in doing good deeds and, and trying to, to obviously have a sense of pride in our search for our relationship with God. And, uh, you know, we, for example, every Monday, we are, we, you know, our group says the rosary. And we have prayers and deeds, and we really try to develop this bond and, and support our local parishes. So, Oh, praise uh, God. I just felt some pride. Yeah. Yeah, great, great. The Knights do fantastic work. You know, as an itinerant missionary preacher with the Fathers of Mercy, you know, I'm not a parish priest per se, but about 70% of my priesthood is spent in parishes a week at a time preaching the week-long parish mission. So I've come into, into contact with many, many Knights Councils over the years that I've been ordained a priest, 20 years ordained a priest and 17 on the mission band, preaching on the road. And uh, I've met some fantastic councils, and I myself am a fourth degree. I, I received the fourth degree the last year of my brotherhood in the Fathers of Mercy, which was two years before I was ordained a deacon. And Jack was telling me during our break that he himself is a fourth degree knight. So, uh, so it, it, the knights are just a fantastic organization. We appreciate all you do. Again, the so-called right arm of the church, and we thank you, knights, for your commitment. God bless you, Dan. Thanks so much for that phone call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Andre in Loxley, Alabama, listening. Well, Dan is, uh, or Andre's fallen away. Instead, we'll head to Lexington, South Carolina. Kelly is a first-time caller listening on Ave Maria Radio. Kelly, you're on with Father Wade. Hi, Father. Thank you for taking my call. Um, 
Here in uh, Lexington, South Carolina, um, we are being required to wear face masks to mask. Mm -hmm. Um, And aside from the fact that there's no empirical data to support uh, the effectiveness of wearing face masks and plenty of data to suggest that they don't work, um, we're still being forced to wear them. And I really feel that this violates um, our First Amendment protection. I have not gone to Mass since they've put that requirement in. Um, I feel that I cannot worship God with a face mask on. Okay. Thank you so much for your call. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, you know, here here's my take on all of this. We may not agree with the procedures that are in place and the importance of where we place those different procedures, but here's the thing. If there's any time at all in the history of the world that we need the Eucharist, it's right now. When there is a veritable culture of death raging out in the midst of the modern world. And if to receive the Eucharist in a state of sanctifying grace, what Holy Mother Church identifies as the source and summit, quote, end quote, of the entire Christian life, then I will wear my mask to go to Mass to receive the Eucharist. And I will offer up my not liking of wearing the mask for an alleviation of the souls in purgatory, especially during this month of November, but even beyond November, because I want to receive the Eucharist. And I can honestly tell you that even if I was a layman living in the midst of the modern world, not a priest, living as a layman in 2020, I would have that same attitude because I know myself. I praise God for the self-knowledge I have about myself, from my faux faux pause to my strengths. And I can honestly tell you that if I was a layman living in the world, I would not let a mask, although I'm not crazy about wearing the mask myself, I would not let it prevent me with a capital P from receiving the source and summit of the entire Christian life. So I would encourage you to still go to Mass. I would encourage you to receive the Eucharist in a state of grace. I would encourage you to continue to go to confession at least once a month. I would encourage you to be an active intercessor as a member of the Church Militant on Earth with the the, the knowledge that you are in a state of sanctifying grace, um, not aware of any mortal sin. And even if your diocese has suspended and still has in place the suspension of Sunday Mass being obligatory because of the pandemic, if you're able to go, you should still try to go, even though the obligation is has, 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 has still in place. I would still try to go to Mass. Look, there's a culture of death out there raging. The devil loves it, and he hates us who try to remain faithful. I choose to be in the camp that attempts to remain faithful to the best of my ability and receive the Eucharist in a state of grace. That's my counsel for you. God bless you, and thank you so much for your call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. That's the number Matthew used in Owensboro, Kentucky. He's a first-time caller listening on the EWTN app. Matthew, you're on with Father Wade. Hi, Father Wade. How are you doing? Hey, is this Matthew Thompson from Owensboro? It is. Hey, Good, Matthew. Matthew, thanks for your call. It was good to see you visiting your family in Auburn there at the Fathers of Mercy, what, just about a week ago, I think? Yes, it was. Yes, great, it was, sir. Great. How are your folks doing? I just, doing real well, sir. Doing, doing really well. Great. Knowing, um, your, dad, really, knowing I, your dad like I know your dad, he's probably listening right now, isn't he? I don't know. I should have told him I was going to call you today. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matthew, what can we do but for I, you today? I have, a, I have a question for you, Father. Um, when is your book going to be coming out on audio? You know, that's a good question that I can pose to EWTN Publishing. I've been asked that in, in recent weeks. Are you referring to the four last things, or are you referring to overcoming the evil within? Both of them. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, yes. So that's a good question I can pose to uh, EW10 Publishing to see if we can get that on audiobook. Thank you so much for the question. I, I don't have an answer to that, but uh, hopefully we'll have an answer soon, and I'll be able to say it on, on the air on one of my Open Line Tuesday shows. So thank you so much, Matthew, for your call. We greatly appreciate it. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America, 833 288 Three nine eight six. We head now to the home state of Father Michael J. McGivney. Uh, Marianne is in Thomaston, Connecticut. She's a first-time caller listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Marianne, you are on with Father Wade. Hello, Father Wade. Thanks for taking my call. 
Thank you so much for your call today. What can we do for you? Well, it's the first time I ever called. I'm a little nervous, but I just wanted to say that a couple of weeks ago, I was listening. I listen all the time to all the shows on EWTN during the day in the radio, and I heard about Father McGivney. I don't really know anything about the Knights of Columbus. Uh, I, you know, I'm not. I'm a woman. I don't get involved. I don't even know anything about it. In any case, I heard about it, and I just felt very moved. So I live in Long Island in New York, and the last two days, I made trips to New Haven to St. Mary's, which is wonderful. Yeah, and right. today I was in Thomaston, and I went to St. Thomas, his second parish, and I prayed there for a while. I said a rosary, and and I walked out to my car, and I put the car on, and what do I hear? But one of you was, one of your callers was making a shout-out to um, the Knights of Columbus, and you mentioned his name, and then you start talking about him, and I just I feel so blessed today as if, you know, yes, this is the right thing to do, and I feel warm and loved and, and really, really blessed. Well, praise God. We thank you so much for your call today, Marianne. Now, you were— you were well, you can't make this stuff up. No, you can't. You can't. You, you're, you're from Thomas, uh, Thomaston, Com- Connecticut yourself? Is that where you live? No, no I'm actually from Long Island, Huntington. Oh, okay. And I, I took— couple hour ride yesterday and today just for really a short period of time i didn't even know if the churches were open and it's just beautiful and it feels good and i touched everything i thought he could possibly have touched i feel so close there was a relic i prayed by his um not casket but you know his tomb yeah i I never expected to do such a thing and today it was just Marvelous. Wow, okay. and then you turn on the radio and you, you hear us talking about him. Well, I would say that Father Malcolm McGivney, Marianne, is trying to get your your attention. The new blessed of the Church is trying to get your attention. Maybe you're meant to be a, a mouthpiece uh, uh, on the Knights of Columbus to help other men join the Knights or to get to know about the Knights. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what, what the workings are here, but I would say that Father Michael McGivney is blessed. Father Michael McGivney is definitely trying to get to your attention, and what a grace to have visited his tomb and to pray by his tomb, and to visit not only the Church of St. Mary's in New Haven, but also the Church uh, in Thomaston, excuse me, in Thomaston, Connecticut as well. So great. Thanks for sharing that with us. We really appreciate it. Andre is back, Father Wade, in Loxley, Alabama, and again, a first-time caller listening on Archangel Radio. Sorry, Andre, we didn't, didn't, we didn't mean to throw you off there. Oh, that's okay. It's, today is actually, well, first of all, thanks for taking my call, and hello, Father Wade. Hello, Andre. Uh, I, listen, I listen occasionally, um, and um, not all the time, but I got in my wife's car to put some gas in it, and I turned on the car, and your show came on, and right away it started to speak to me like, maybe you should call this program because I'm having uh, issues with my youngest daughter who's 17 years old. And um, a little bit of background, and then maybe you can give me some advice. I've been married for 26 years, lifelong Catholic, three kids. Um, we uh, uh, kids go to a Catholic uh, high school, and uh, my youngest daughter is 17. And her her complaint about father about me is that I am too controlling about different aspects of her life, and I want to know where I should be as a good Catholic father. Um, she's had one boyfriend for a year, and then there were a couple more boys. There's a second one that. My wife and I felt she was leading on, and then she told him that she wasn't interested, and now there's the third boy. And she's been grounded because of a violation of trust. She did a couple of things she wasn't supposed to, and everything came to a head last night when um, I told her I I want to be very careful about how much time you spend on the phone to this new boy because I don't even know who he is. And uh, it came down to she was very upset with me and told me she hated me and uh, went to bed. And then I I sent her uh, an email today, told her that we need to compromise and work something out. And she sent me another explosive email. So I just feel like I have failed and I need some advice. Okay. First of all, I would stop the emails because it's not going to do any good. Uh, Face-to-face is always better, even though that may take a a time, a a certain amount of time to to happen, uh, a sincere sit-down. First of all, you cannot do this alone, okay? The best thing that a child from the age of reason, where they can begin to make moral choices around age seven, all the way up to their emancipation from the home, even if they're in their 50s and you're in your 70s, The absolute best thing that a child can see regarding 
their own life is their parents united on two fronts, the moral front and the faith front. If your child, in this case a 17-year-old, has any indication or any inclination that she can wedge something between her mother and father to get one of them on her side, both parents are doomed. Because the parent that she thinks she can get on their side is going to be abused by the child, a, 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 a relationship of utility, utilitarianism, and the other one will be shut off. Now, I want to say something about her telling you that she hates you, which she told you last night, you said. Chances are she doesn't hate you. She was speaking uh, in a moment of rage where there probably wasn't much will involved to literally make the decision that she wanted to tell you she hated you. Okay, so that's number one. So, yes, she said it. I'm not denying she said it, but I doubt there was will involved given the, given the, the heat of the moment. Okay. And second of all, your wife needs to be with you on this. You need to ask your wife first, am I being unreasonable? Our daughter needs to see us unified. If I'm being unreasonable on any of this, please tell me where I'm being unreasonable. And have the humility to hear your, uh, your, your wife out. Have the humility to hear your wife out on what your wife tells you in response to whether or not you are being reasonable. There is power in two things over your children. Number one, your covenantal marriage. The church's teaching on the sacrament of matrimony is clear about that. You have power over your children in virtue of the covenant of marriage, beginning with the truth, capital T, that God will provide you and your wife with the graces necessary for not only the unity and indissolubility of your marriage, if you're both willing to work at it, but God will grant you the graces necessary for the procreation and rearing of your children. That is promised in the teaching on the sacrament of matrimony. Number two, as the priest figure of the home, the Christ figure of the home, the father figure of the home, the head of the home, you have power, spiritually speaking, over your children and your spouse, but it's not a power that's meant to, meant to be wielded over them like a tyrant. It's meant to be wielded over them like the wise, prudent, and servant king who wants to serve his citizens first and put him his own self on the back burner, okay? Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church, giving himself up for her. In other words, your relationship towards your spouse and your children is one of sacrifice. It's sacrificial, okay? It's not one of lording it over them like the imprudent king or the, or the prideful king. So you have power through the covenant of marriage to unify with your spouse in the rearing of your children. And number two, you have power in your office, capital O, in office as husband and father, the Christ figure, the priest figure over your home. I want you to be able to grow in that office and do what you need to do to unite with your wife in seeking out her wisdom Remember, she's the heart of the home, and the head and heart work together. So a great witness question. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your call today. Sorry, we're not going to have time to get to the rest of you. Maureen in League City, Texas, call us back tomorrow. I want to hear this story. Uh, Father Wade, uh, they can find more of what you do at fathersofmercy.com, including some come and see weekends. Would you lead us, leave us rather, with a blessing? I certainly will, Jack. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon all of our Open Line Tuesday listeners and remain with each and every one of you this day and always. St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, and Blessed Michael McGivney. Pray for us. On behalf of our host, Father Wade Menezes, our producer, Michael McCall, call screener Ryan Penny. And our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in. Back at it tomorrow with Father Mitch. Until then, God bless. This is Al Cresta. Let scripture and the truth of the Catholic Church guide you with today's issues. Cresta in the Afternoon is next on most of these EWTN stations. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. We've started doing these shows, call in if you're an atheist, call in if you want to redefine marriage. Those are the kind of shows that make very engaging radio. We're going to continue to try to reach out to the fringes and find 